Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. We as always are thrilled with the speaker that we have lined up for you. It's great fun on my part to meet uh, new people in horticulture, to find out their knowledge and to be able to share it with you. So I was just telling our speaker, Shannon Curry, that I don't know much about grasses and sedges. So I'll be learning a lot right along with you. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Education and Collections Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and we welcome you today. Here on the East Coast, it's a little bit chilly today. I know spring is there, and Shannon says she's down in North Carolina and she's seeing more signs than we are. So I'm very glad to know, and I can hardly wait to, I can sit out on my deck and have my gin and tonic and, and smell my viburnum carlisii and, and enjoy that. So today, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll return to them at the end of Shannon's presentation and answer as many as we have time for. As always, we never have as much time as we want, but we'll get some of the questions answered. And I'm thrilled to introduce you to Shannon Curry. And Shannon, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself and jump into your presentation. And I'm going to disappear and let all the, the spotlight shine on you. Okay, so, great. Thank right. you, Cindy. I'll I so appreciate you. being here. Okay. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with people and... Um, and Sam, I'm so delighted to be here today. And I have been in the uh, the nursery industry uh, for about 15 years, uh, 20 years at this point, about 15 years of those, I spent working with a wholesale nursery that specialized in grasses and grass-like plants. And so that's part of what has led me today to talk with you about native grasses and sedges. And recently, I have joined uh, the group, the team at Izell Native Plants, and we're an online uh, retail source for native plants. And my job is to talk about these wonderful plants and to share that with you. And so I'm going to focus on native grasses and sedges and, and them as smart choices for better landscapes. So let's get going. And I will first, when I talk about grasses and sedges, I want to mention first that on the left, you see that is turf grass, and that is not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we'll talk about grasses. Some people refer to them as ornamental grasses. I just like to call them grasses because they have all kinds of use. They aren't just pretty, aren't just ornamental, but just to get that definition aside, we're not going to talk about turf grass. What we are going to look at today are grasses in landscapes, especially public domains. This is on the High Line in New York City. More and more, we're seeing grasses in, done beautifully in settings where um, we spend our time in these public spaces. The Lurie Garden in Chicago's Millennium Park. This is in Chattanooga, Tennessee at, a, at the Tennessee Aquarium Conservation Institute. Beautiful landscape really focusing on grasses. Um, all kinds of urban settings from Mayor Bearden Park in uptown Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live um, in North Carolina. This is a couple of hours away. I'm in the central part of North Carolina. Um, I'm near Raleigh, North Carolina, where we have a beautiful park that features a number of different grasses. Um, if you look in the mountains of North Carolina and Asheville, this is a green roof. And you, we see in these public spaces, grasses and sedges are showing up more and more. And the Washington DC area. This is a very simple area around uh, just a utility area in a public park um, that uses grasses in that landscape as well. And even on, this is a photo from the interstate in North Carolina, one of my recent travels, uh, just in a rest area. This is a native grass showing up in a landscape. And what I've seen in the past number of years working in the plant industry is really that grasses have become increasingly more popular and they're much more visible in these public spaces. And I think there's several factors that contrib contribute to that. One is an increased interest in native plants and a more ecological focus. Um, I think people understand that our landscapes really are disappearing, that there's pressure from the loss of biodiversity, from the loss of species, plant and animal. Um, we also wanna think about 
our resource use? Are we doing that in a responsible way? We're also seeing increased development and the use of green infrastructure. So today I'll talk about some of these factors and then connect them to using grasses and sedges in our landscapes. So let's just take a quick look at what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to start with the big uh, green picture, I'll call it, um, and then look also at some grass fundamentals, I'll call them. Um, so a way to um, talk about the role that grasses play, a few definitions, what do we mean by grasses and sedges, and then also look and spend the bulk of the time on finding solutions with grasses and sedges. So looking at some common landscape issues and how we can solve those. And then I'll wrap up with how do you find out more about grasses and sedges if you're interested in this. But first, let's step back and look at that big picture. And I do mean big here. We're gonna go back and look at the United States from space. This is a satellite view at night. And what really jumps out are those urban centers that light. And we can see where populations are really concentrated. In fact, an estimated 83% of the US population lives in urban areas. That's right now. And by 2050, even more of us will live in urban areas. And that's happening worldwide as well. Now that doesn't mean we all live in the middle of a city or in a downtown but it means that we're living in spaces that are defined as urban or suburban and have higher density. And that for me is really easy to think about and see in this graphic from North Carolina where I have data from. Um, this is just a graphic that shows the average number of acres per housing unit. And so this is from 1940. And when the population of North Carolina was about three and a half million. And so what you're seeing as it um, as the colors become move from green to the to the oranges and the reds and the pinks, that indicates greater density. So less space per housing unit. And so in 1940, you can see what it looked like. Well, by 2000, our population in North Carolina had more than doubled to 8 million. And you can see what's happening over time. That green space is reducing and you're getting more and more housing units per acre. And when we look at projections into 2030, which is not that far off anymore, when we're up at 11 and a half million, increasingly we're losing space. In fact, North Carolina lost about 100,000 acres a year to development. And during the height of North Carolina's building boom, which is continuing at this point, we lost about 383 acres every day. That's about two and a half acres for every person who moved in. Now, increasing density and development has some real upsides. There are economies of scale and resource use that make dense development really smart in many cases. But what comes with that too is a loss of green space and that has some real downsides and we need to be addressing that. The green part really matters when we're thinking about our urban spaces. And one of the easiest ways to conceptualize that and to see that on the ground is to look at how it affects water use and stormwater and how when we have rain events, so when we have a rainstorm or we have rain, what happens? When you have natural ground cover, and you can see here, um, when you have natural ground cover, when it rains, about half of that water seeps down into the soil. So it infiltrates, you know, it soaks into the soil profile. About half of it goes down to the ground. Uh, you lose some through evapotranspiration. So it goes up through those plants into the atmosphere and only about 10% runs off. But what happens as we increase the amount of development and impervious surface up to maybe 75 to 100% in very dense areas, as we lose that green piece, what we find is that only about 15% actually soaks into the ground and more than half runs off. That's a very big difference. And that runoff is capturing all kinds of pollutants that are on our rooftops, on our streets, and is goes into our stormwater system. So what you can see is really that green part matters and plants offer real tangible benefits in managing stormwater. And in fact, really our landscape can be a green filter 
filtering out those pollutants, letting the rainwater sink into the ground, or it can be a gray funnel where we're allowing those pollutions, those toxins to be washed into our waterways. And so the green part is really important. And that's where the concept of green infrastructure really makes a difference. And we can't build our way out of dealing with the impacts of development. We have to use green um, to do that for us. So green infrastructure is using natural systems, so vegetation, soils, natural processes to manage that water and create healthier urban environments. So taking a space like you see there on the left, this is on a university campus, just this kind of leftover space between two dormitories and transforming it into a system that treats and manages stormwater. So what we're doing with green infrastructure is adding ecological function to new and existing development. We're making it do more, we're adding on. Green infrastructure can be a lot of different things. It might be urban forests or tree wells, um, what we call green streets, uh, rain gardens, um, green roofs and malls, water harvesting. So rain barrels are green infrastructure. And really importantly, conservation. So taking care of what is already there. That's our best approach. But when we can't conserve, can we add better ecological function to those spaces? And in fact, I would, whoops, excuse me, back up. I would argue that all of our managed urban spaces are in fact green infrastructure. That gives us opportunities to bring more to our landscapes. That's good news that development gives us opportunities to add benefits. And so we can manage those spaces differently and use green infrastructure. For example, a rain garden on the left in a residential community, green streets, adding plants to those kinds of stormwater management techniques and programs. Um, this is at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. They manage water from their parking lots in bioswales and permeable pavers and all kinds of different natural ways in the gardens area. They can be beautiful spaces. This bioretention planner in Lancaster, Pennsylvania was designed by Claudia West and it adds this wonderful amenity to a vibrant urban space and makes it more exciting. We can go up, go to rooftops um, and have green spaces above that also manage and treat stormwater. It can be simple plantings in medians between our streets that adding that utility, that function of um, ecological benefits makes a huge difference. And so that use, especially when we're looking at using native plants, we can make a real difference in those spaces. And this really fits the gardening trends that we see. So uh, a recent poll that was done by the National Wildlife Federation um, and released um, back in 2021 looks at some of those trends. And we understand that more and more households are specifically purchasing plants to help butterflies, bees, and birds. We're buying plants that help out wildlife. We care about that. In fact, people are also purchasing specific plants because they're native to their area. Um, in fact, there's a 50% increase in people planting with native plants for certified wildlife habitat gardens. Um, there's so many more people understanding and wanting more for their landscapes. And in fact, people are converting parts of their lawn. So rather than turf grass that you saw in that one of those first slides, people are converting that to natural or wildflower landscapes. So a lawn that's not about turf grass, a lawn that's about other plants. Um, what we understand now and we want and we know is that plants aren't just pretty. There are a host of other benefits, both economic, um, environmental and health related. And in fact, in the Netherlands, there was a comprehensive study, a longitudinal study that showed for every 10% increase in area of exposure to green space, translated to an improvement in health equivalent to being five years younger. And that was controlling for all kinds of other factors that we know can affect health and well being. The health benefits that were associated with that exposure to green space. Um, included long-term reductions in heart disease, in cancer, in musculoskeletal conditions, and it also reduced people's level of obesity, and they added higher rated, um, self-rated mental health. We understand that being around plants can improve our health and well-being in so many different ways, and the good news about this 
is that every plant counts. And so we can improve our quality of life by using plants in our landscapes. We can use plants to create better landscapes and we can shift how we think about our landscapes. So I would advocate that rather than judging based on just the aesthetics or how tidy a landscape looks, um, that we see beauty and how it's part of the larger whole. We see that space is beautiful because it's working. And grasses fit into this framework really, really well. And I want to talk about now how that works. So let's take a shift and talk about a few fundamentals about the role that grasses play in creating better landscapes. So what do we mean by grasses? Well, first of all, oops, let me get us going here. Okay, when I talk about grasses, True grasses, when we say true, what that means is grasses in the family called Poaceae. And interestingly enough, grasses are, the Poaceae family It has the widest distribution of any flowering plant family in the world. You find grasses in, on almost every continent, including Antarctica. Grasses are in all kinds of environments. They have an extremely wide distribution. Um, and you find them in habitats that are really difficult and demanding. Um, grasses evolved over millennia, a number of strategies to help them survive under very difficult conditions. Um, they have a photosynthetic process that handles heat, um, high heat load, difficult conditions really well. We don't have time to go into that today, but just recognize grasses have some real adaptations that make them um, really able to survive under tough conditions. Um, one of those I'll mention and we'll talk a little bit about is a highly efficient fibrous root system. Um, their roots spread out quite a bit. Um, those root systems have some real advantages in terms of improving the soil and allowing for um, things like rainwater to soak into them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a couple of slides later. In general, most of the grasses that we see in our managed landscapes, most do best in full sun. The ones I'll talk about today are those kinds of full sun uh, grasses. There are some that do well in shade, but most of the time um, you're, uh, you know, it's okay to think about grasses as mainly for full sun, but there are some exceptions to that, of course. Sedges, which are grass-like, look like grasses to most of us, are actually in a different plant family. They're in the Cyperaceae family. Um, there are a number of different uh, genera that, that are in that family, but the largest genus there is called Carex. And um, some people pronounce it K-Rex, depends. Um, but um, anything you want to call it is just fine. But Carex is also a very large genus. There are over 2,000 species of Carex worldwide. Um, interestingly enough, when you have a genus that's that big, you typically see lots of different forms of plants. So you might see tropical plants and you see some that are woody and some that are herbaceous, meaning that they're, um, they die back to the ground or they go dormant in the winter time. You see annuals, you see vining ones, you see trees. But interestingly enough, Carex, all of the species in that genus are herbaceous perennials, meaning they come back every year and herbaceous meaning that they don't have woody uh, material in them, um, but that they typically go dormant and um, they die back to the ground um, in the winter time when they're dormant. So they're all herbaceous perennials. And they also have fibrous root systems, which makes them advantageous for the reasons we'll talk about. And they have a range for sun, to sun tolerance. There's some that will handle full sun, but a lot of them are very well adapted to shade and that gives them some advantages for some of the the uh, problem solving we're going to talk about so grasses in the poaceae family sedge and cyperaceae and we're going to really confine our discussion here primarily to those that are in the genus carex so that's where we're going these grass-like plants grasses and sedges really are pretty resilient and easy to deal with as i've mentioned before they're very widespread plants, um, so they're widely adaptable to a range of conditions. They like um, not particularly fussy about soils. They're not fussy about pH. 
Uh, they'll handle um, some dry soils, some clayey soils, some wet soils, and we'll talk about those as we uh, mention them and go into the plant list a little bit later on. They're relatively pest and disease free. Doesn't mean they never have problems, but compared to a lot of other garden plants, they're really pretty easy to deal with. Most of them really don't need to be fertilized. Most don't need what's called supplemental um, you know, nutrition. In fact, most of these plants, um, you know, I just wouldn't mess with fertilizer at all. Some of our species of prairie grasses, for example, are so well adapted to lean conditions that if you fertilize them, they actually grow really lushly, but they'll flop over, they don't do well. They're really adapted to handling tough conditions. And I'll talk about some of those selections. Also, a lot of the grasses I'll talk about today are very drought tolerant. They don't need to be uh, irrigated. They don't like this. You don't need to put an irrigation system to have these plants. Most of them, you can water them when you install them. Some you'll want to make sure they have adequate water for the first year while they get well established, but afterwards they really don't need a lot of supplemental fertilizer or irrigation. And also they're pretty easy to manage. Um, you can cut them back once a year if it's needed. With grasses, I would do that regularly once a year, uh, late winter before early growth emerges. With sedges, it really depends. Uh, they're more slow growing than grasses in general. So I would only cut them back if they really look um, quite tattered, if they don't look good and you feel like you need to give them a hair, a severe haircut, you can do that. But again, late winter, uh, sedges will start uh, breaking dormancy earlier in the season. So, you know, get them late winter. Um, and in fact, some of our evergreen sedges, which I'll talk about today, I wouldn't cut them back at all. I would just groom them a little bit, maybe take out some dead uh, material if it's there or snip off the dead ends, but really you don't need to cut them back, um, especially if they're evergreen. So well, we'll talk about some exceptions to that, but in general, really pretty easy to deal with. And grasses and grass-like plants really add ecological value. They help suppress weeds. So you can see on the left, um, this is a switchgrass, which has a really dense crown. This helps um, when you're planting close together, as I'll talk about, that helps outcompete weeds. These are good competitive plants in a lot of cases. That root system, which you see there, remember I said they have really fibrous branching root systems. That root system infiltrates into the soil. So it gets down into the, into the soil that helps open up space so that water and oxygen can get in there. So that helps break up soils like clayey soils like we have in parts of North Carolina. It helps break those up. In addition, as you think about a plant's life cycle during the winter time, maybe half those roots will die off. That's a normal process. And that opens up channels, again, for air to get into there, to, for the water to penetrate into the soil. And it also sequesters carbon. So it's holding carbon in, in the side the soil. So it has some real benefits. Um, those grasses help slow runoff, increase infiltration. So when you think about water that's running off, if you've got that plant crown right there, that really nice root system is there, holding in the soil, reducing erosion, and it's slowing stormwater. If you look at the top of that plant above the ground, we're also allowing that stormwater filters through there and it slows it down. So that's a real advantage as well. And when you think about that root system underground, a lot is happening. And I wanna give you just a real quick look at that underground. So much of the time we're focusing on the top, but what is underground matters. And so this is a, uh, has been around for quite a while. This is an illustration of the root systems of prairie plants. It goes down to about 15 feet, as you can see there, branching fibrous root systems that are really penetrating the soil. What I wanna point out on the left side there in this illustration, that is turf grass. So you can see not a whole lot is happening in terms of a root system there. But if we're focusing on those functions below ground that roots really fulfill, those prairie plants, those prairie grasses that I'm highlighting here add a lot of value. And continue with ecological value as well. 
believe it or not, people don't think about uh, grasses and sedges as pollinator plants, but they very much are. There are a number of our native sedges that are host for pollinators. Um, there was one, Carex pensylvanica, I'll talk about Pennsylvania sedge, that hosts 36 different species of caterpillars. Uh, little blue stem is a host for skipper butterflies. So while most of the, our, these plants are in fact wind pollinated, some uh, there are some creatures that do eat that pollen and they are also nesting material for birds and small mammals. They provide food for some of our uh, grassland birds. They provide forage. Um, so there are lots of real benefits that, that happen when you add grasses and sedges. And they tend to be plants that deer don't like to eat. They're not at the top of the buffet menu. Sometimes sedges in the spring have new growth that will be browsed a bit. So it's nice and tender. But in general, they aren't top of the buffet line and they'll recover very quickly from that spring, um, that spring nibble, if you will. And also, I can't ignore beauty. We I've said plants aren't just pretty, they also are, um, they have these ecological functions, but they are gorgeous. And I will say, I think grasses have a unique beauty. Um, they they share some qualities design qualities, if you will, or aesthetic qualities with other perennials and other plants. But to me, they have a unique set. And I'll just mention these very briefly um, because I don't have time to talk about all of them. They really are amazing plants. Um, the translucence of them, as you see in this photo, they catch the light like no other plants do. The linearity is an important piece of that. So they have long linear foliage that contrasts beautifully with other broad foliage plants. Um, their texture both visual and actual, their tactile texture um, is wonderful for softening hardscapes, for really providing beauty aesthetically. And also they provide an emphasis in the landscape so they can be a focal point, almost those exclamation points in the landscape that will draw your eye across a landscape and create a rhythm from a design perspective. So they're wonderful to play with um, in your designs and your compositions. And their seasonality is outstanding. Grasses change throughout the season in their colors. Um, with some plants you get early on, you get blues and greens and they change throughout the landscape. And in the winter, they provide um, beautiful structure. Um, grasses, unlike a lot of other herbaceous perennials, typically keep their structure even when they go fully dormant. And so keeping them up in your landscape provides amazing seasonality. And in addition, movement and sound. Um, I don't have a video here or sound, but if you've ever walked into a field of grasses and heard um, the rustle of the grasses as the wind moves through them, um, the crickets chirping, they're just, the movement and sound is something that just provides peace and tranquility in your landscape. So I will say there's just a big package that grasses bring to our landscapes. So with that in mind, let's talk about better landscapes and finding solutions with grasses and sedges. So I'll start with what's a pretty typical look in the landscapes. Um, this is in my neighborhood in North Carolina. And, um, you know, it's it's doing some several things going on here. We see that we've got some turf grass on the edge. This is a, a roadway that sees a fair amount of traffic. These are crepe myrtles that are beautiful when they bloom in the summertime, uh, but this is the back side of a residential property and they've got mulch there. Um, they do have to spray because they get a lot of weeds because mulch grows weeds, um, even if you, you know, but if you're just having mulch there, you're going to get some weeds. So they have to spray that um, with some pesticides. Um, they have to mow this periodically. And so this is a landscape that requires, um, you know, to stay tidy, requires some resources. And so I think to this landscape can do more. And I think there are some challenges here that can be difficult to deal with. And that's what I want to focus on for the, for the remainder of the talk is some of these challenges and some aspirations that we have. So we have, when you're spraying, you know, you have to think about runoff or picking up those pesticides and there may be low spots that never dry out. We may have runoff and we may have erosion. Um, it is difficult to mow this hillside there. Um, and in some cases, it's really hard to grow turf grass and it doesn't grow in shade. So um, we don't wanna deal with weeds all the time. 
I'm happy as a gardener to do a little bit of weeding, but that's not what I want to spend all of my time doing. We want to increase the ecological function of this space. And in fact, there's some challenges here and some dreams that we have. And in fact, there are there's an alternative. How about instead we reduce the area of traditional lawn instead of turf grass everywhere? Maybe we shrink it and have spaces that we're using in ways, you know, maybe that's where children are playing, um, you know, there are games happening there that your pets are using that. But basically we're shrinking that amount of traditional lawn and use plants that provide a similar look or function, but use fewer resources. We want to swap mulch for more plants. Mulch grows weeds. And so plants are helping out compete that. And plants are adding a lot of function. So we're increasing biodiversity and gaining ecosystem services. And so I think it's really helpful to think about these alternatives in terms of the functions that are happening in the landscape. And that's where I want to look at those functions and grasses and sedges that help us realize those functions. And one of those is covering the ground. And so we want something that's low growing and easy to manage, but also provides wildlife habitats, gonna serve those creatures that we share our, our world with. We're gonna manage runoff. So we wanna slow down stormwater as it rose, runs across our landscape. Uh, we're gonna provide um, some infiltration, let that water slow down, soak into the ground and decrease that runoff. And we wanna reduce weed competition. Again, here we wanna have something that goes better than mulch. We wanna create a living mulch. And so it might look like what we think of as more of a traditional ground cover. So maybe big sweeps of a few plants that are rather than turf grass or mulch, we've got these beautiful sweeps. This is um, grass, these are sedges in this playground area in a public park. We also can do something that's a little more complicated and a little more biodiverse. So we might have um, a ground layer that's a base layer of a more complex planting. It might include other ground level species um, and then planting into that base layer. Uh, this is best illustrated, I think, or one of the better illustrations is from Planting in a Post-Wild World, the book by Claudia West and Thomas Rayner. Um, they've um, got this wonderful diagram that shows a ground cover layer that is composed of lower growing plants that are performing those kinds of ecological functions. They're slowing down stormwater, providing wildlife support. And then a seasonal layer above that, a seasonal theme layer that you've got your color that might change um, plants emerging from that that are taller, a uh, little more showy, um, providing color across the seasons and then a structural layer. This ground cover layer is really the heart of this. And I like to think of these plants, um, I call these, the they're really the backup singers of the plant world. Um, they're not the stars of the show. They're the ones though, tying this composition together. They let the melody sing, but they're providing the support. They really are the foundation of this design plant community. And you can see it happening here in just very simple plantings. Um, on the high line, uh, this is Carex bromoides that is beautiful here with this heuchera, letting that pop. At the Mount Cuba Center in Hokessin, Delaware, you can see again, this just foliage plants, this interplanted with other perennials or really fun display in the Sassafras All Children's Playground in Raleigh, North Carolina. And as I mentioned, you can have these matrix style plantings where you've got this base layer. Um, these are all very complex, beautiful plantings that take advantage of this ground cover layer. Um, this is, these are of course designed uh, in the left to ball horticulture in Chicago Stock Exchange uh, by Roy Diblick at the Denver Botanic Garden Chatfield Farms um, by Lauren Springer Ogden. This planting is handling all of the stormwater runoff from their parking lot. So covering the ground has some real advantages. And I'll talk about, just I'll touch on a few of the plants that do this really well. Uh, Carex pensylvanica is a sedge. So a Carex, as I mentioned, um, Pennsylvania sedge. It is by far right now the most popular native sedge in the US um, with, with good reason. It's a very well-behaved spreader. So it forms um, what I would call a green carpet. It's a rhizomatous spreader, has very fine textured foliage, 
Um, it does very well in dry shade. Uh, this one can be mowed like a lawn if you'd like, but it forms this really beautiful carpet. Um, you find it here. This is in the mountains of North Carolina where it's growing naturally. Um, and you can interplant this when you can see it on the upper left with other perennials in there, some trillium in the spring blooming. Um, you can use it in very stylish plantings. I love how it's in the bottom left there um, in a more um, residential planting. But Carex pensylvanica um, prefers sort of cooler climates here in uh, central North Carolina. It can struggle in the heat of summer um, and will be a, not quite as lush and full as you see here on the right side in this, in this planting uh, in a cooler climate. But um, it is wonderful for that spread. Um, now, the challenge is, of course, that in warmer climates where heat is, um, there's a higher heat load, what can you use instead? Well, there's another option called Carex texensis. Um, that's one that is, um, it is actually native to the mid-Atlantic also, but you find it really further south into Texas and some of those southeastern states. But it also has very fine textured uh, green foliage. Remember I said, these are the backup singers now. Um, this one will can also be mowed. Um, it tolerates some foot traffic. I love how it's used here in this um, a public spot that's on a university campus where they've used it as the green mulch underneath other woody plants. I'll show you some other photos of this um, as it's dormant in winter time um, and emerging in spring in the bottom right. Um, this is a plant that will handle a sedge that will handle a little bit more heat. It's a little bit more tolerant than Carex Pennsylvania, excuse me, Carex Pennsylvania is but it is a clumping species. So you need to plant this one a little more densely to get that coverage, but it has long blades that will, um, if you let it uh, you know, kind of lie there, it will overlap with each other and will cover the ground and help um, you know, suppress those weed seeds. So that one's for a little bit drier conditions. I'm gonna mention a few others that are similar and maybe for different conditions. So Carex bromoides is another uh, fine textured, sedge with those long blades. This one likes wetter conditions. It also does well in shade, but it will adapt to a range of soil conditions. So it will do average soils. Um, this one also has a clumping habit. So you're going to plant relatively close together to get some coverage. It is absolutely beautiful in larger masses. Um, I love it here. This is in, in the middle uh, photo there, the middle image. You can see it in a low wetland area in a, a preservation site. Um, used beautifully, as I showed earlier, on the high line brome sedge um, used um, underneath this uh, phlox and the heuchera as well. Um, there are a number of sedges that I'll mention. Um, there's these have been um, recently gotten a lot of attention from the Mount Cuba Center or from Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. And they, I'll, I think I'll mention that later on in the talk too. They just published trials from um, a four-year trial of native sedges. They um, trialed about 70 different sedges and there were a number of theirs that were top performers in the Mid-Atlantic. So um, Carex Pennsylvanica was one of those. The Brome sedge was another, the Carex bromoides. One of their the top performer in their trials was, oops, let me back up, was Carex woody eye. And I'm going to mention that. I don't have a lot of experience with that because it's not one that the distribution is not really so much in North Carolina. It's really uh, typically in cooler climates, but it was the top performer in Mount Cuba Center's trials. Um, unfortunately, it's not really readily available yet. Um, in the nursery trade. And so you should see it sort of filtering out over the next few years. Um, it is available somewhat, but uh, because of Mount Cuba's report, it's become very popular and sold out. So um, do keep an eye out for this one. It is a wonderful plant. It can also be mowed um, to form more of a lawn alternative, but there are a number of other sedges that are also good performers. Um, some of these were really, really good performers in Mount Cuba's trials as well. Um, they've done really well for us in, in North Carolina. And I've listed them here. Again, these are fine textured uh, green sedges that are great for that under planting um, underneath other, other plants and for you know kind of layering. Um, so let me move on to a number of different ones too. 
because I want to cover a bunch of these and I've got some limited time. One of my favorites is uh, blue wood sedge, Carex laxaculmus. The cultivar that's most readily available in the trade and in retail for most folks is bunny blue. Um, super cute name and a beautiful blue foliaged sedge. What I love about this is that this one is so lush and delicate looking, but it is actually a really tough plant. Uh, you find it typically in fairly moist environments, but it really handles drier conditions. It handles both wet and dry. It handles clayey soils, um, average soils. Um, it's a really tough plant. And um, I like because it is a fantastic substitute for liriope or monkey grass, as most people know. Um, liriope spicata in particular is a very aggressive spreader. Uh, liriope muscari, not as aggressive, but gosh, once you put in liriope, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Carex laxaculmus is a very well-behaved plant. It, um, it will spread by gently reseeding. It's not much of a rhizomatous spreader, has very short rhizomes, so it's not gonna spread, it's not aggressive, and has beautiful textured, um, that blue textured foliage. Um, it's one that is mostly evergreen. Um, it will get a little bit tattered by the end of winter, but really is a solid sedge for a ground cover or a matrix planting. Another sedge that is super tough is Carex Cherokee Insis. Um, this is one that has a little bit of a different range, which I'll show you here in just a moment, but I always include this one in talks because it is one of the toughest sedges. It sails through the heat of the summer. It stays evergreen in winter. Um, it's a little bit bigger. It's a bolder plant. Um, it's more of a naturalistic look. So it's not quite as tidy as some of the other sedges, um, but it is one that is highly deer resistant. And it is one that also is a bit of a spreader. Um, it has these really beautiful pendulous seed heads that you can see there on the left image. Um, on the upper right, you can see the range of it is a little bit limited, but we find that it is really quite adaptable to a range of environments. Um, I'd say it's hardy up to probably zone six um, and it forms a beautiful ground cover. It will colonize. Um, it will reseed. So it's one that you want to put it where you're happy having more. So this might not be one you want to put in a, a highly managed or a very tidy bed that's, you know, maybe at the in the front of your house. Um, it's one that's a fantastic filler. Um, it can be used quite ornamentally, though. Um, on the left, you see it here in Duke Gardens. This is a public garden where in their spring woodland garden, it looks fantastic on this slope. And I show it to you on the right because this is a very steep landscape here. This, this is a spring woodland garden. You've got this lovely stream going through it and it is put on these hillsides to help control erosion there. This is in the middle of winter. It is evergreen. It is holding in that slope, doing a fantastic job there. So let's move on from the sedges to some full sun plants. A couple of grasses that I'll mention for that ground plane layer. This is purple lovegrass, Aerogrostis spectabilis. It's one of our beautiful uh, native grasses that's quite short. It's only a few inches tall, less than a foot, has airy pinkish seed heads. Um, it forms dense clumps, so this is a clumper. It will reseed gently. It can spread slowly. This is wonderful as a ground cover. It loves dry, rocky soils, difficult conditions, really great for those edges of parking lots. It's also used by nesting grassland birds for cover, for nesting sites, food for overwintering birds, and has this really charming little seed head. Another native grass, and this is for full sun, is prairie drop seed. It has very fine texture, a mounding habit. So again, this is not, not a rhizomatous spreader, it's a gentle reseeder, has really beautiful fall color. Uh, it is drought tolerant. It is a relatively slow growing uh, plant for a prairie species. Uh, it needs three or four years to get to full size, but it is well worth the wait. Um, it's one that with fall planting, you need to give it time to establish before uh, the winter sets in. So this is one I might plant about a good six weeks before the first freeze. Um, but it is 
beautiful as a matrix planting. So that matrix, remember, is that ground cover layer where you might plant other plants into it that are taller. So on the left, you can see it as a matrix grass, matrix planting. On the right, as a beautiful ground cover in this um, wide open setting. And as I mentioned, outstanding fall color. I'll also mention too, and this is in, um, will be available on the handout um, that I think Cindy will make available, uh, some companion perennials for covering the ground. Um, these are plants that really play well with these other ground cover plants, grasses and sedges, um, some ones that are native to North America and do really well. So, and I'll move quickly through a couple of other functions I wanna talk about, which is, we talked about covering the ground. Also, we wanna manage water where it falls. Um, what we mean here is to slow and treat stormwater. We talked earlier about that runoff that occurs when you um, don't have a lot of green spaces. We're gonna use plants to help manage that. We want it to soak into the ground. Um, and one of the best ways to help manage stormwater is to disconnect your downspout and put that water out into a landscape where you can treat it either in a rain garden a bioswale in a low wet area, maybe if it stays, you know, you have those wet areas that stay constantly wet. Um, when we're treating it this way, especially in a rain garden, you want plants that handle both wet and dry conditions because a rain garden is, is designed to let it soak in. So it's not gonna hold that water for a long time. It's not gonna stay wet all the time. So in this case, you want hand plants that handle both kinds of conditions. And so you might just be planting around, for example, a storm drain. Um, you might be doing it a little more stylishly with these bioswales or bioretention areas. Um, but whatever you're doing, you're looking at plants that are gonna be able to handle those conditions. And one of the sedges I'll mention is Carex amphibola. Uh, this is Eastern narrow leaf sedge. It's a generalist. You find it in all kinds of different ecosystems. It prefers moisture and shade, but it's adaptable to all kinds of conditions. It handles both wet and dry. Um, it's a good grower. It forms this dense budget bunch, as you can see. It's mostly evergreen. Um, on the right, I show it to you. This is in a bioswale after two feet of snow have melted off of it um, in February. So it is evergreen. This is in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, so you know it can handle uh, the climate there. Um, this is a reseeder. It will spread. So you wanna put it where you want more, but at the bottom of a rain garden, it's gonna be a great selection. I also mentioned two sedges that I've already talked about, that Carex laxacolmus hob or bunny blue and Carex cherokeeensis. Both these hedges, sedges, will handle both wet and dry conditions and are both really tough plants. There are also a host of wetland sedges, uh, our native species that are adapted um, to wet environments, but it turns out these can actually handle a wide range of habits and soil textures. So these are ones that um, tend to be pretty competitive. They'll reseed, they'll hold in soil, control erosion. Um, these are ones, again, not something you might put out in the front of your house, but, or, you know, they're not neat and tidy, but they are competitive enough to handle conditions where you've got a lot of weed competition. Um, they're going to hold in the soil and hold that rain garden and help you manage that area. Um, they're also really great for wildlife support. I'll just mention a few. There are a bunch of different species that um, range from mostly shade to full sun, and in this case, you'd want to sort of check the requirements for the individual species. I'll mention just a couple um, that are really strong um, and also, I think, really nice ornamentally. Carex stricta on the left and Carex gray eye with beautiful seed heads. Also, I can't talk about um, wet conditions without mentioning soft rush, Juncus suffusus. This is one that thrives in wet conditions. Um, you find it typically even along um, wetland areas and in ponds, but it really um, is one that will handle average garden soils and drier conditions. And it is on here because it is a powerhouse for wildlife support. It provides nesting sites for birds, food um, for um, mammals and uh, all kinds of creatures. So it's just a really great plant to have in your landscape. Um, as I said, it can handle average garden conditions. You often find it in your ponds. Um, and then the grass I'll talk about for rain gardens is uh, Panicum virgatum. Um, this handles both wet and dry conditions. 
It is such an adaptable plant. You'll find it in all kinds of ecosystems. Um, it is just outstanding for wildlife support. Um, I could put this on the edge of a parking lot. Um, I could put this in a meadow of prairie planting. I can use it in all kinds of conditions. Um, here it is in a rain garden. And there are a number of different cultivars available. Um, one of the most popular is Shenandoah red switchgrass. And you can see it here, Cape Breeze. This is a short one that I love in this home landscape. Um, switchgrass also is great in the winter time. It provides beautiful structure. So this is one that will handle both wet and dry. It's great for rain gardens, for bioswales, but it is a plant that is really great for other applications as well. And I'll show you just quickly this list of a few other rain garden perennials. Um, that's also going to be available in the handout that you can ask, uh, you can get. And um, these are ones that play well with grasses. They're beautiful. They handle the similar conditions. And I'll wrap up with talking about just the last function is choosing plants for resilience and good looks. Here we want plants that are easy, that are no fuss. You know, we want plants that handle um, urban settings, difficult sites where we don't have to do a lot. We don't have, have to add a lot of resources to have a landscape that looks good and is having ecological function. I think of these plants as on the edges. You know, these are along driveways, median strips or on slopes. And um, coincidentally, the very factors that make them great for those kinds of on the edges also make them really great for container gardening. So well-drained soils, you know, full sun in a lot of cases, these are plants that look really great in containers as well. So if you don't have a landscape, you don't have outdoor space um, for a yard, you can have containers. And so these resilient plants, these really highly functional tough plants, Got to mention switchgrass again, because I said earlier, you know, this is one that handles a range of conditions. Um, switchgrass is super tough. Another one of our native uh, grasses, this is a prairie species that you find in grasslands all across the U.S., uh, not just in the Midwestern prairies. This is the sun-loving, drought-tolerant little blue stem. This is one that is so well adapted to difficult conditions that you really it doesn't like fertilizer. It doesn't like irrigation systems. This is one that you throw at that really tough dry spot. Um, so it has outstanding color. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is a host for skipper butterflies. It also supports birds and small mammals eat the seeds. Um, it just handles all kinds of different um, tough conditions like the top edge of a rain garden that drains really quickly, rock gardens along the walls. Uh, rock walls, for example. Um, the blues is a cultivar that has outstanding color. So is a uh, standing ovation is a beautiful selection from North Creek Nurseries, uh, just outstanding across, across the seasons. You get these ranges of colors in spring and then summer and in fall. And in fact, little blue stem is such a great plant. It was named in 2022, the perennial plant of the year by the Perennial Plants Association. And then I'll wrap up with uh, Muhlenbergia capillaris and a couple of thoughts and selections um, that are related to that. Um, this is a pink muley grass, not hardy for everyone probably listening to us today, but um, it is a beautiful plant up to maybe zone seven, push it up into six, of course, but um, it has beautiful pink plumes, full sun, good drainage. It's one that really I wouldn't plant late, late, late in the fall it really needs to get established before you go into the winter time. So it might be one you plant in spring or even late summer, but it is outstanding. It's a beautiful plant. If you like pink muley and you haven't ever tried the white version, I would urge you to do that. Um, it is bright with color. It stays um, more colorful later in the season. It blooms about two weeks later than pink muley grass um, and is really uh, a cool selection to have. And I'll also mention Muhlenbergia reversonii. So if you if the pink muley is not reliably hardy for you, I would urge you to try Muhlenbergia reversonii. It's hardy to zone five, 
so it's more, more cold tolerant, and it handles wetter conditions than pink muley grass. It's not quite as sensitive. So that's a great one to try. Um, it's in the, at Brookside Gardens in their bioswales there. Um, it has a very limited range, so it's not really native to a lot of folks, but it is a plant that's well adapted to a lot of conditions um, that you'd see in some of our viewing area, I'm sure. So here it is in that bioswale. Um, in Brookside Gardens. And then I'll mention just a few of these uh, plants for erosion control on slopes. And so to wrap up, I will say when we're thinking about those functions I mentioned earlier, so we're, we've talked about today with grasses and sedges, we're covering the ground, we're using low resource plants, we're managing stormwater on site, when we're doing all of those things and adding ecological value, I hope you'll agree that Grasses and sedges offer smart solutions and better landscapes. And so in just the next 30 seconds or so, as I wrap up and we have time to take a few questions, I'll mention uh, again, it's resources. I'm with Izell Native Plants. We are an online uh, resource for sourcing native plants. You can order from us um, and get whole, uh, plants from wholesale nurseries and ship them directly to your home. Um, through Izell Native Plants, but mainly we are a source for education. So if you have questions about these plants, you want to look them up, we invite you to visit our website and learn more about them. And we're adding content all the time. I also mentioned the Mount Cuba Center report. Uh, so Mount Cuba Center has a trial report about native sedges. Um, I, it's a fantastic resource. I cannot say enough about it. So definitely check that out. And then there are a number of different um, books out there right now. There's certainly a lot of stuff online, but these are a number of books by authors who really know what they're doing with grasses and sedges. Uh, there is that list available as well to you. So highly recommend them. And I'll just wrap up and remind you that every plant counts. We can make a difference. And I would also urge you to grow natives when you're choosing. So I will stop there and say thank you very much. I've gone a little bit more, longer than I'd like, but... Um, I think we have time for just a couple of questions, maybe, Cindy? Yes, but I think what you have presented for us as resources is everyone's best bet. Thank you so much, because that was a fast run through. I saw many, many, many of my favorites, and I appreciate that. But I think the resources that we will show, letting everyone know that this presentation will be put in our Let's Talk Gardens video library, as well as we will list your handout underneath the presentation or on the same uh, web page as the presentation. So they will have that as well. And then the, the number of books and other resources that you shared are absolutely perfect because there's so many different plants out there. It's yeah. nice to get those lists and be able to work off of them. So you know, well, this is one question, what kind of a carrots do you put on top of a berm in Boston? So uh, you know, those, those specific questions are in the uh, uh, chat box, uh, but I know that the resources will help everyone. But one I thought was very good to talk about was you mentioned they were deer resistant. How about bunny rabbit, groundhog, um, dog urine, all that other stuff? How resistant are they to being eaten by all kinds of critters? And how resistant are they to be able to withstand the visitors that come to our gardens that may not always be as welcome because of what they leave behind? Ah, great question, Cindy. So they um, typically grasses recover pretty quickly from being browsed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the sedges, sometimes you get new growth being browsed in the springtime. Um, I have rabbits that will often mow down a couple of mine. The nice part about uh, sedges is that they will recover from that pretty quickly. You typically get a second flush of growth from sedges. But in general, they're not browsed by many creatures. Um, grasses tend to be Often the blades are a little bit less palatable, especially as they mature. Mm -hmm. So you don't see them being browsed by grasses for that reason. Also other creatures as well. Um, they, um, 
grasses flush out later in the season than sedges do. Most of them are warm season um, growers, so they come in a little bit later, and that growth is not typically as tender, um, but they often have enough uh, growth power in their root system that they, even if they get browsed, they're going to flush back out again. Um, so they um, occasionally too, I know um, that voles can sometimes eat the root systems mm -hmm. from underneath, but again, because that fibrous root system often spreads out, it rarely results in the death of the plant. Right, right. And uh, I'm going to emphasize the fact that we've had some really great uh, recommendations in the chat box. Okay. So if people want to record that, if you look at the bottom of your chat box, you'll see where you type your own message. There are three little dots that follow a happy face. If you look, click on those three little dots, one of those little dots will allow you to record the chat box. Um, in addition, we'll be able to put some of the information up on our handout that we'll share, and that will be available again on our video library. And Zach does the work, and he knows it's going to take him about two and a half weeks to be able to get the closed captioning correctly or corrected and edited before we post this presentation. But in the meantime, check out all the different websites that Shannon has recommended, the Mount Cuba study, and I won't say it, but there's some terrific companies out there that have wonderful catalogs that you can browse to to be able to get good information. So Shannon, thank you for enlightening on us and such a wonderful uh, group of plants that are so hardy and add so much to our landscape. You are very welcome. Great. Well, we will see you all soon. We have a great lineup of speakers coming in our spring and our summer months. So I hope you all will be able to join us for the rest of our speakers. I'm really heavily emphasizing what we can do to help prevent or help mitigate. We're not going to prevent climate change and help make us a more sustainable uh, gardens in the United States as well as elsewhere. So thank you again, Shannon. Uh, we'll, we'll be glad to read your, your handout and hope you enjoy this beautiful spring. Thank you. Same to you, Cindy. Okay. See you all later. Bye-bye.